I don't, I don't miss those days at all. Uh, I don't see. Yeah. Yeah, I haven't. Uh, brings back some memories, though. I haven't had to deal with that. And shoot. It's probably been six six years now. How come you triggered I've been out of that. Really? Yeah, when you started your stream. Oh. Well, that's unfortunate. <laughs> 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 hey, hey, hey. You're asking me about KK? <laughs> oh, man. Oh, my God. It's... You going to get in here? You know, you were late last time. Now you're pulling in late again. I'm late. I'm just trying to get comfortable. You're 30 seconds behind schedule. We're already live. That's cool. You can hear my voice. <laughs> okay. Uh, we'll get into it. So we're doing a kind of a, a two, more of a four-part thing month to month. Um, this month for August, so tonight is a kind of a mechanical overview on the air-cooled side. That's going to be the focus. Tomorrow night, we'll get into more of the control side. And when I say controls, I mean... Uh, the, how the, the chiller and the logic inside the chiller and everything makes the decisions it does, why it stages, why it just uh, trips on a safety that it does, anything. That's going to be more of tomorrow. So tonight we're going to be hitting on the different, some of the different components and different types of, say, evaporators and coils, going into the compressor circuits, refrigerant circuits, how we main, uh, manage our oil systems, uh, we'll also try to, if, if we have time, we'll go into some of the economizers and GPM balancing. So I'm going to try to cover as much ground as I can. We have a lot of ground to cover in just two hours. So, uh, and then next month for September, we're going to do the same basic process, but on a water cooled side. Now that includes just anything water cooled. Water cooled could be a uh, scroll, um, they can be scroll, recip, uh, screw, or centrifugal, which centrifugal probably being what most people think of when you think of a water-cooled system. So getting into it. Uh, so if a <clears throat> air-cooled chillers, they, really what they boil down to is it's just a, it's, it's a air conditioner on a roof. The basic process of a chiller is we are using hydronics. We're using water. The good things about having an air-cooled system, it means that all of your heat rejection that you have gets sent through uh, condenser coils like a regular AC would have. So we pump the uh, superheated gas up into a set of coils, fans turn on, reject that heat uh, via air. But the evaporator side of the system is water. So we're moving water through an evaporator and then the refrigerant is pulling the heat out of that water. So when you're dealing with air cooled, that water flows into wherever it's going to go, whether that be a air handler system, uh, whether that be fan coils, it's going to have some kind of load somewhere else. Or that could be in a, in a more industrial setting, uh, process cooling is what we would, we would consider it. It wouldn't be comfort cooling. So most of what I'm speaking to tonight will be with a comfort cooling uh, mindset, but in a process cooling scenario, that chill water could be flowing through equipment. Uh, so say you've got a big CNC machine or something in a, in a factory, well, they've got uh, cooling connections that can hook up to it that will help cool those machines down. We've got one plant we used to work on that was a vacuum facility. They, they rebuilt, manufactured, and tested industrial vacuum pumps. And so these systems had to be cooled so we would run, uh, they would run chill water through the pumps as they were running and doing their vacuum operations. So there's multiple ways we can use that chill water. In a comfort scenario, it's almost always going to be some form of a coil with a, with a fan blowing across it like a regular air conditioner at that point. Um, so for those who are familiar with a self-contained design, you know, with a self-contained, uh, you know, SWP or SWC, depending on whether train, McQuay, whatever, you know, you've got the, uh, you've got a water-cooled condenser. 
and, and but your evaporator is is air air cooled or air heated however you want to look at it right your evaporator does the air side with an air cooled chiller it's it's really the same basic process just in reverse instead of putting the heat into the water we're putting the heat into the coils and we're we're taking heat from water um, with that being said you've got three primary types of evaporators we use today uh, we have a, a dx evaporator uh, we have flooded and then you could have a braze plate now i'm going to preface these two uh, when I say DX or flooded, while that is the term for them, the actual term for the evaporator is considered a uh, shell and tube. Meaning that we've got this big cylinder and inside of that cylinder uh, you have various copper pipes of any arrangement size depends on the system design manufacturer and whatever so this would be looking at the long end where the end bell is on whatever that tube is that would be a shell and tube uh, heat exchanger it doesn't matter whether it's doing condenser side or evaporator side it's the same basic functioning principles now the difference between the dx and flooded is a dx uh, the refrigerant is inside. Oop, that's not. Is inside tubes. And on a flooded refrigerant is uh, outside tubes. So to kind of carry this forward, uh, let's talk about a DX system first. So what you would have is it wouldn't look exactly like this. It would actually be a, uh, uh, a assortment of, say you have a two circuit system. So your evaporator would have a divider plate in the middle. So this would be circuit one, this would be circuit two. Inside of here, you're going to be inputting your two-phase refrigerant. So after it leaves the metering device, you're now in a two-phase condition. So you're going to be inputting your two-phase refrigerant here. It's going to go through and it's going to loop through this, uh, uh, through the barrel, and then come out the top on your suction. Right here, two-phase and then at your suction. And it's gonna do the same thing on both sides. So your suction will always be on the top and your, uh, uh, your two phase line after the metering device will be on bottom. Everything around those tubes is water. The entire shell fills with water. And at this point, one of the critical things you're going to pay attention to is this, this is coming into the end bell of the heat exchanger. Okay, I want to point that out. Yes? Are they single pass or two pass? Uh, either way. Yeah, yeah, yeah. However you slice it, it's coming in and out the end bell on a DX. Okay. Um, on a flooded, you have in your water, so your water would come out the side. I'll point that out. Uh, so you'd have uh, your water points. So this would be on one end. So let's say you actually had your, your cylinder here. Uh, most of the time, it's going to be this end is your in with the in and out either way uh, you have your in you have your out uh, 
and then your refrigerant lines are coming in here, your two phase, and then out here is your suction. Okay. Uh, on this isn't the only configuration. This is the reason why I'm pausing here. They get a little more complicated with this on some designs. So, for example, York, uh, the YCIVs on this on the larger tonnages, they actually input. Um, I'll draw it with a different color so you can kind of see. They actually input on either end. They go in and in, and then in the middle is your out on a common out. So you may see a, a setup like that, where your, your water pipe comes in and the uh, in, in, entering flow wise off and then ties in on both ends of the, of the barrel, and your outflow may just be out the center port. So just one of a couple of different styles they could do it in. Uh, for the flooded, it is uh, the flooded style is internally what most people would kind of relate to in terms of how a flooded works or how a, um, uh, a shell and tube works. And so when we see lots of pictures online, the whole in plates off, you got a whole row of tubes and all that's happening. Well, your typical uh, typical flood is going to look exactly like that. You'll have your uh, ports or your your in bell. Um, on a flooded, we have water uh, inside the tubes because the refrigerant's now on the outside. And so we don't have a circuit divider anymore, at least not at the end bell. But there still would be a divider, and I'll explain that in a bit. So what you're going to have, especially with an evaporator, most of your most of your uh, water is going to be towards the bottom half of the barrel. So your, your, your tubes will always be submerged. So I may be drawing it a little high, but your, your actual water will be flowing through the bottom section of that evaporator barrel. The whole top section typically won't have, and it's just a big open uh, cavity. Okay? So here... Uh, you have, let's see, it's water. There would be a divider like this splitting the middle. Let me draw this a little better. You have a divider splitting the middle, and so your, uh, you, you're going to be reverse or counter flow. So your inlet would be the top side, and your outlet would be the bottom because you want your water running counter flow to the refrigerant stream. So you're always going to input the refrigerant to the bottom of the heat exchanger, and you're going to take it out on the top if you're talking about an evaporator. A condenser would be the exact opposite, right? So we want our liquid two-phase coming in the bottom, so with that, we have to have our entering water on top and the suction side of our refrigerant is pre-cooling that entering water and the final cooling happens where we boil is happening down in the, uh, the lower section below the refrigerant level and that's where we start to get into approach values. And we'll talk about approach and all that later. Um, so you'd, your pipe connections would be up top here. So you have your in, uh, and then obviously down here you'd have your out. If we drew this on a different scale, so you have your uh, water here, out, in. Say you had two circuits. So we had a two-circuit machine, you would have a divider plate right down the middle. This half would be circuit two. This half would be circuit one. Your, your two-phase line at this point is coming in down here in the bottom. So you'd have your liquid line, your expansion valve, and then you tie in. 
your suction would come off somewhere up here up top. Typically it'll be right at the top or maybe slight off to the side or something. But you get the point is your suction, you'll have a, a, your suction line coming off the top here, flowing out. Uh, this would be your suction. And then both sides are gonna be the same thing, but they're on separate circuits. Is that making sense? If I start to lose anybody, just say so. I, I wanna make sure we can all get track of this. Um, so your actual refrigerant level in here is typically going to be about half to uh, maybe a third, somewhere between half to a third level, I would say, on most machines. Uh, Are they using a liquid level sensor? Say again? Are they using like a liquid level sensor? So they can, yeah. Some machines do use like a train... Um, Train RT, she was, no, it's not the RT, it's the C, oh, come on, come to me, the screws, yeah. not the C-GAM, C-GAM's a scroll, the train, the newer train screws have a liquid level sensor that controls the EEV. The ones I just worked on over there? Yes, Are yes, the those, huh? The AA? No, those aren't AAs. Uh, anyway, regardless, yes, you can do liquid level control. Majority of them use actual superheat to control that. So in essence, it's the same thing. Yes. Yeah, whether you're doing it via liquid level, whether you're doing it via superheat, it's just everybody's got their own flavor and how they want to do it. From, yeah. from the EV. Yes. Yeah. Yes. RTAC. That's the one. Uh, AC. That's the one I'm thinking of. RTAC. Not the, no, I'm sorry. Not the AF. The AF is the stealth high ends. That's the, not that one. The other, other one. Uh, anyway, the RTAC. That's the one I was looking for. Thank you. Um, anyway, so up here is your, is your vapor, your superheated vapor. Down here is your two-phase mixture. And then obviously prior to that should be a regular liquid line. The easiest way that I could recommend to anybody, and I made mention of it earlier, is where does the refrigerant piping tie in? If you walk up to a system and the refrigerant piping is hitting the end bell, and the water is hitting the shell, you have a DX evaporator. If you walk up and it's the other way around, your water is at the end bell and your refrigerant lines hit the shell, then you have a flooded system. And it, it is really all what it boils down to. It's not any more complicated than that. Uh, and as far as... Um, Far as I'm aware, I don't know of anybody, at least not on a standard scale. So this would apply for sure to York train carrier. Uh, I mean, those are the three big ones we've got around here. Who are some of the other one-offs? Yeah, Daikin does it the same. I'm trying to think of a Daikin that uses a, a shell, though. Most of them are, are braze. We don't have that many big dike and air cooled. McQuay's, sometimes I've seen McQuay's with them. Yeah, so McQuay's going to be the older, older series dike. And so, anyway, moving on. Um, any questions on DX or flooded at this point? Okay. Braze plate is exactly what it sounds like. It is just a stainless steel uh, little rectangular square that has however many plates. They could be a 16 plate, 12 plate, 30 plate, 50 plate, you name it. All that's pre-engineered, pre-figured. None of that really matters to us at the end of the day. Uh, the same basic principles apply here, though. 
You're going to have your two face coming in, your suction coming out, EXV will be down here. Your water will be uh, coming into the top, out the bottom. And if this was a two circuit system, so let's say we are looking at the face of the plate. So this would be a side view. Uh, these are typically, or not typically, these will be insulated. So uh, unless it's a economizer, so a lot of the time, a lot of times the economizers may not be insulated, but the um, a true evaporator will be. So if you're looking at the plate, you'll have uh, your suctions up here, your two phase lines down here, and then on the back side, your your waters will be just in the middle, and they'll just be a fitting sticking out. Now, something I'm going to point out: I'm not going to draw a line down the middle. Because these don't divide that way. Each of these plates create different chambers. Okay? So for example, uh, we'll make black our water. This chamber here is water. This chamber here would be circuit one. Uh, if I'm not mistaken, this chamber should be water. Uh, this chamber would be circuit two, and then you're back to water, and then circuit one, obviously this is not a perfect drawing, so just forgive me, but you get the concept. Each plate is layered so that the heat exchange can happen evenly all the way across. And that's why we're not going to have, like, these are true dividers. Like, that's a literal steel plate down the middle, cutting that in half. This does it literally between the plates. And those plates, if you ever took one apart, so from the outside, the end plates will be nice and flush and pretty. But actually, inside of them, you've got this kind of a wavy, textured pattern that creates more surface area for better heat exchange. Yeah, no, that's exactly what it is. So the one we've got sitting in the shop, it's, that would be something we would use on like a condenser system or an economizer system uh, on the water side. But that one is not a true braze plate. That one is just a plated. The way it exactly, it's the exact same principle. Yeah. And these are what I use for my little homemade subcooler, right? So if you have, a, most everybody's seen that at some point. I really enjoy that thing. But uh, <laughs> the uh, that's that's the same that's the same theory. And it's just all it is is just a braze plate. That's all it is. Uh, anyway, these are the three most common types. A lot of times the smaller machines, your uh, screw, oh, I'm sorry, your scrolls and even your recips may have a brace plate of some kind. Now recips, uh, anything I talk about recip is going to be fairly old stuff. Anything modern or even relatively new at all is going to either be scroll or screw. Uh, I'm trying to think. we well, we just tore out a bunch of recips this last year all over the place. We got more we're taking out this next year. Uh, I'm trying to think of one. The one I'm working on uh, is brace plate. Yeah, I and mean, those are scroll yeah, too. Big ones. Uh, uh, yeah, I'm just trying to think of, of if we if we even still have any that are recip that are air cooled anymore. I don't think we do. Yeah, I think all of them we, we've got now are, are screw or scroll. Okay, so honestly, I probably won't spend too much time on that just because we there's just not many of them anymore. The scrolls replaced what the recips were doing in the air-cooled market. So they just made more sense, inevitably. i uh, take a quick peek here. Yeah, this looks like we're chatting. All right. Uh, questions on brace plate? 
All right, I didn't finish my thought. I just realized that. Yeah, smaller machines, your larger tonnage uh, is going to be one of these two, flooded or DX. Now, the vast majority are going to be a, a uh, DX. And that's for a couple of reasons. One, it's cheaper. They require less refrigerant. Uh, and it's cheaper to manufacture because if I'm not mistaken, it has less uh, overall tubing inside, if I'm not mistaken. Um, and uh, uh, yeah, that's the big thing is it's just cheaper. It takes you know, and the, the removed refrigerant cost because you have to think, all you have to do is fill up these tubes here and that's it. Instead of having this entire cavity, you've not a, you now need standing liquid refrigerant inside of. The problem with DX is it's not near as efficient as flooded. So as we continue to move forward with high efficiency systems, you're going to see more of the flooded side over a DX. Just because to get that level of efficiency, they have to go with a flooded uh, uh, footprint. It just the DX can't compete with that, and that gets back to um, to the approach value. So I'll make a quick plug on it here, just because I've got all the pretty drawings already on the board, and I really don't want to erase it. I'm actually kind of proud of this. I'm not very good at drawing. I think I did. I think I did all right with this one. Yeah, see, there you go. <laughs> anyway, approach. Okay, the simple or the formula for your approach is uh, saturation. So it's more of this will be specifically evap. Evap sat minus leaving water equals approach. That is an indicator of heat exchange efficiency. I ran a service call on a, it's not even truly a chiller. It's a uh, DX, uh, it's a water-cooled DX system. It's, you have handbell screw compressors and a C, no, uh, MCS panel to control it. And that system hasn't had its annual inspections yet, so we're getting ready to do that. We actually have it under contract. We'll, we'll need chiller techs on site to run this inspection, but... Um, the tubes are, it's got an open loop tower and the tubes are in severe need of punching. Uh, so we were running, when I was there today, a 30 degree approach on a, uh, on a flooded condenser. That should be, uh, that should be around three. So a system like that, I'd be okay with five. I'm going to give it a little more buffer, but by the book, it should be more like three degrees. And these systems are having head pressure issues. They're having, like, they're having issues. The whole reason I was there to begin with. But um, uh, that's what you have to be careful with is uh, that where that approach value is and that telling you what your heat exchange looks like. So <clears throat> a typical flooded, I'm sorry, a typical DX evaporator, you're looking at about four on the really good end, maybe with a light load, to 10 degrees of approach. Four to 10 of AP. Um, once you start hitting that 10 degree mark and start pushing that further, that's when you really want to start looking at why is this happening? You know, do we, are we, um, do we have some kind of flow issue? Are we having a heat exchange issue? Uh, if you, if you have too much flow, you will create what is referred to as laminar flow. <laughs> uh, it, yeah, I mean, he's, he's went through this recently. <laughs> so you will, con you will create what is laminar flow. Uh, and so you're not going to exchange heat properly. And we'll, if we have time, we'll get into that later. I'm not going to spend time on that now. 
Uh, a flooded system, so typically a, we'll say a 0.5 to 3 degree uh, approach is pretty standard and acceptable. So anywhere in that range. Well, it's kind of the same principle. Once you start pushing beyond that, uh, you, you probably have a problem. And honestly, if you have a DX system that's doing less than 4 degrees, you might see that with a really low load. Uh, and I'll preface, you know, a low load to a, uh, well, we'll do this. What would you consider a low load on a regular split system, you know, and, and how would you read, how would you read that? 68. 68 what? 68 on the return. Okay. So 68 return, you would see that as a low load condition. Minus 35 degrees would be what your saturated temp should be. So... In the, uh, in the chiller world, we would consider a low load anything less than basically five degrees um, from set point. So if we're running, if we have a set point of say 45, 44 degrees, if we have less than about 50 degrees on the entering water, you're going into an unloaded state. It's not taking a whole lot of cooling to maintain that. And chillers run the most efficient, or screws do at least, once you get them with more of a load on them. And that's something that a lot of people really struggle with, is uh, the, these chillers are not meant to cycle. It's not a good thing when they cycle. And that's a, that's a concept that's completely different from uh, you know, regular air conditioning. And we'll get a little more into this tomorrow on the control side. But your, your focus is to allow this machine to maintain as, as stable of an operation for as many hours as possible. And that's your, that's your end goal. And the less modulating it has to do, meaning that, you know, it staging up or staging down a little bit, and we'll get into that more, uh, the more efficient that machine will be. Any questions up to this point? We do have one online. What do we got? Uh, let's see. Do I need to judge approach with the two circuits running full load? Does approach double when only one circuit is running? Um, so that actually, that's, that's a pretty good question. The approach value should not change regardless of how many circuits are staged. What will change... Yes, you will get approach on, on individual circuits. What will change is the saturation values and the leaving water temperatures you can maintain. Now, here, and since this came up, a big caveat you have to be careful with when you're looking at approach is what condition is your loop in? You want to look at approach after everything is stabilized and you're consistent. I'm really glad this came up because I almost didn't preface this. Uh, if you look at approach before, so say, say you turn this thing on and you've got a 60 degree entering water and you're trying to pull down to 45 degrees, you're going to go into a pull down state. And in that condition, you're going to run what, what would look like a really high approach value. And that's because that machine's trying to rapidly take that load down as best it can without overdoing it for the compressor so that it, it'll capture that and get you at set point. It's only focus at that point is hitting set point. And most machines, you'll even see a uh, thing pop up that'll tell you, um, uh, you know, pull down state. You know, it'll, it'll go into a separate mode just for that. So you have to let that clear first. So you need to be at running conditions as best you can be. So essentially, once you have hit set point, and you can maintain set point and the machine begins to modulate based on set point and the refrigeration circuit has uh, stabilized at that point 
then you can start paying attention to what that approach value is. And it doesn't matter whether it's one circuit running or two circuits. What will change is the saturation temperature. In the same way, if you have like an interlaced coil on a regular uh, split system, all right, so you've got two coils that share, or you have two circuits that share the same coil that's interlaced. Um, when you run both circuits together, you will pull a lower saturation than with just one circuit by itself. In the same theory, it can happen that way um, with a shell and tube heat exchanger or even the brace plate. You know, both sides of the spectrum, you will see lower saturations. But ultimately, your approach value should maintain consistent because that is just an indicator of, of the heat exchange that is happening. Hopefully, that was a good enough answer. Uh, yeah, awesome. Okay. Uh, let's see. We were going into compressors next. All right. Let's see, I'm gonna, like I said, I'm gonna briefly touch on the recips. I'm not gonna spend an absorbent amount of time on them. Uh, we will get into the scrolls and screws. We'll, we'll spend the most time on screw just because I think that one's the one that gives everybody the most trouble. It's also the one that has the most, uh, you know, it's the most sensitive, it has the most parameters. the unloader ever kind of messed you up at all? As in... So getting closer, like you said, to set point, you know, and then, and then they start unloading. Yes, and that's why I say you need to make sure you stabilize first. So just because you get down to set point, if the refrigerant circuit hasn't stabilized because of the pull down, it's still premature. Um, because there's some buildings, so to give an example, if the building was actually hot, it wasn't just the loop was elevated temp, then once you start getting down to set point, you're going to see that return temperature is going to level off, or the entering, sorry, the entering temperature is going to level off, and then it's going to start to slowly decrease down, right? And at that point, your circuits will, will track with that. As, that. as your entering decreases, it's going to unload the compressor to maintain the leaving at its same value of the set point. So it still tracks. Right. Now, if you did not have a hot building, you just had a hot loop, and uh, so that you were doing a PM or something, then that, that would be a common occurrence on a PM. You're, you've, you're gonna have to wait until that return levels off, which usually doesn't take very long. If it's just the loop that needs to be pulled down, vast majority of the time chili is going to do that pretty quickly and so you just you have to wait for the system to stabilize whatever that means at that time but the first thing that has to catch up is the water once the water catches up then the refrigerant will do its thing and then it'll find its happy spot well, yeah they track the same with the heat exchange right i mean it's just the linear line yes ultimately Uh, oh, brace plate approach. Thank you. Um, typically, uh, it usually will track in that 10 degree range. That 4 to 10 degrees of approach is pretty typical for most of the, um, most of the brace plates I, I've, I've worked on. I don't remember, uh, I don't remember the actual factory specs on those, but just from experience and memory, uh, that's usually what I see is that 10 degree or less is what I'm shooting for with a brace plate. Thank you. Uh, compressors, yeah. We have scroll, recip, and screw. Scrolls, I think most of us are familiar with. It's got a big, well, pet. See, that's what I'm talking about. I had I had a <laughs> I had a good drawing going there. All right. You put that motor on the top. Got your discharge. 
you got your suction. Scroll is a scroll. You know, you've got, you have the, the newer, what they call, what, 3D uh, scrolls versus um, just a standard. So um, scrolls have, uh, I mean, they're just ultimately, they're an on-off, right? And so when it comes to how we control them, we can run them variable speed, and we're seeing more variable speed systems out there. So uh, that is more on the uh, that's more on the uh, RTU side. Some of the really new air cools might start to have some uh, uh, variable speed scrolls, but I don't think too many of them are using those just yet. Most of the time, they're just they're just contacts in a panel. At least the ones I've worked on recently. Um, and a lot of the time I'm trying to think, I don't, so you walk up to some of your RTUs and you may actually have unloading capacity inside of that, uh, that scroll. So for a scroll that unloads, you have two methods of doing that. You either have this little, uh, head sitting on top that comes out. And it's got a solenoid valve, uh, and then that ties into the suction. And it's just a bypass. It'll be a tiny little line, and they've got everything sized uh, accordingly so that it unloads the the screw or the the scroll uh, by like fifty percent of its actual capacity. All right, that's what it's actually doing. Uh, you don't see that much on chillers. You know, most of the time they either utilize that full capacity unless they're variable speed or they don't. Now, another alternative option, if it doesn't have this on the, so you have your pecker head here for your uh, wiring connections. You have three wires. Well, on the back side back here, you'll have another one looks just like that if it's a regular plug style, but it'll have like two blue wires coming out of it. Um, those two, uh, those two blue wires are the unloader coil. And instead of having an external unloader, it's doing it internally. And they just trigger that, uh, I think they're 24 volt, a uh, little 24 volt coil inside the compressor and between your, uh, your discharge head and your scroll plates, it's got a little valve that it actuates in there and it just bleeds a calculated amount of refrigerant to reduce how much physical volume flows. And that's really all that we're doing. When we start talking loading and unloading any refrigerant system, what we're really talking about is how much volume of refrigerant we're moving at a given time. Because in the same way that we look at it from an air perspective, that, okay, can we run 400 CFM and achieve five tons or 60,000 BTUs worth of cooling at 400 CFM? The answer is no. I mean, not realistically. So, because uh, typically, you know, the, the industry standard would be we want 2,000 CFM, you know, just standard here, not actual calculations, to move that many BTUs. In the same way, it takes X gallons of water a minute, X GPM, to move X BTUs of heat. That's, that's why they size pipe the way they do. It's, we have, you know, if, we, if, if we've got this tonnage, we have to move this much water. The same thing for the refrigerant in the, in the system. If we want to move X amount of BTUs, we have to have this much flow. Refrigerant flow is created at the compressor. So if we want more flow in a scroll situation, we have to turn on more compressors, or if we have any unloaded, load them. Make them spin more to where they pump more to get more flow. It's the exact same concept across the board. It's just different ways of using the same, uh, the same mechanical theory. seconds 
I don't know that I've seen it that way. Usually, I've seen it based off of um, uh, based off of actual like set point. If I'm not mistaken, I'm not. So some of the newer scrolls and the unloading, like why they unload, that's where I do have a little bit of fuzziness because I haven't read those manuals quite as in depth as I have a lot of others. I spend most of my time on screw and we don't have, we have some scroll air cools, but we don't have many. That's also because most of what we work on is too big for them. You know, we don't, we don't have that many uh, small air cooled. So, but you, I mean, if that's the case, I mean, yeah, it's, so you're, you're saying that majority of them you've seen, if they want 50% capacity, they stage the, they turn the unloader on and off yeah, after so many seconds. They'll, they'll use the, whatever the time frame is, I guess. And then if, if you want a 50% capacity, say it was 20 second time frame, you run 10 seconds loaded, 10 seconds unloaded. Okay. And that would give you your 50%. Oh, you've you ever seen an unloader go? Well, you watch your pressure just go. Oh, oh yeah, I hate oh, I hate doing scroll. You can, you scroll can hear those things when they unload. Yeah, they hate it. Every time. They hate it. Just go watch one of my Aeon videos. It just makes you cringe. <laughs> <laughs> it makes you freaking cringe. Huh? I mean, I was talking about the rooftop ERBs. Hmm? Rooftop ERBs. They were they had they were big ones, you know, like probably like you know, hundred something ton. They would, they had scrolls and they, they were the, the ones with the, the second pecker head. And right. You could sit there and just watch it. It was calling for 50% capacity, 10 seconds loaded, 10 seconds unloaded. And it would just do it over and over. Is the system never stay on? Well, they can keep the temperature. The, the idea is to keep, is to keep it flat line. Uh, moving into recips, trying to think. So, the semi-hermetic recips are probably the most common uh, when they were used. So we're talking like Carlisle uh, 06 series, 06 uh, E's and D's specifically. Um, I'm trying to think of if I've worked on one that, uh, that had a hermetic recip. I don't think I have. I don't think I've seen one. I'm sure they existed at one time, but I don't know that I've actually ever seen one. So anyway, if you come across one, vast majority of the time, there'll be, you know, there'll be some version of Carlisle of what's left in our area. Train has their own recips. Uh, genuinely, those train compressors, I've seen them in the wild and I've never seen one run. <laughs> <laughs> I just, they're just, they're, they're, they're old tech, uh, you know, at least for, for us, you know, I'm, I'm sure there's some uh, chiller guys out there that's, that's been around longer than I have, that that'd be a different story. But for my case, it's not a thing. So I don't see us running into that. Ultimately though, you've got, uh, you've got usually either two or three heads. So a D series should be two heads, one on either side. If I remember correctly, and an E series will have three heads. The E's are a higher uh, capacity than a D, and they're usually a little bit bigger body size. So these are very common to have unloaders on the heads. Uh, you can have multiple ways of unloading them. Uh, Actually, this one, usually on a D, you'll only have one head unload, not both. Uh, and then on an E, you could have two heads unload or just the one. Yeah, yeah, no, it, well, yeah. At that point, you're cut down to a third of the capacity. Or these, you can cut down to half capacity. And then your discharge will be here on top. This top center head is your discharge head on this series. Um, like I said, the last big ones we had, we took out this year. Um, yeah, or end of last year. We took them out end of last year, something like that. Let's get into screws. 
Screws are, uh, they actually had a pretty bad rep in the early days from what I understand. Uh, as long as I've dealt with them, I've always had a fairly decent opinion of them, but I've also seen after they've had all the bumps and bruises to figure out how to do it the right way. When you're dealing with a screw, a lot of times you'll have this big, funky looking elongated body especially if you're talking a train or a York. And then you also have uh, handbells, which will look like one big giant pill shape. So if, uh, that, that would be the handbells and there's one other manufacturer, if I remember right, that looks pretty similar to a handbell, but they, they are different. Um, anyway, Speaking, the ones where you'll probably see the most are going to be the train and the Yorks. So back here, this little slimmer portion, this will be your motor. This flange back here is your suction coming in. And then this motor will be connected to a um, bearing. It'll have a bearing. The motor will be connected to a male bolt. And how these, uh, how these work is you have a male and female. Typically your male is the, uh, that's a bearing. Typically your male is the driver and your female is the secondary bolt. See how well I can actually draw this. Have another shaft, bearing. Bearing, and then. <laughs> and so then you'll have your discharge coming out. Uh, now yeah, York has this whole end piece sticking off the end of it. Trains are a little simpler. For, simpler, anyway. None of that's our point. What these are doing is these are, uh, they're, as the two screws spin, is creating a positive displacement. And, at, and it, it literally will pull the refrigerant up into the suction end of the screw bolts and will force it out the discharge by spinning it. So if you're familiar with a, uh, a rotary compressor uh, or even a, a supercharger on a car, honestly. So yeah, if you're looking at a car supercharger, that's exactly how these function, if that means anything to you. If not, maybe you'll be familiar with a rotary style compressor. Either way, we, what we do is we just, we spin whatever device and as we spin it and it, gets narrower, the actual space gets tighter as it moves forward. And as we tighten that space, compression happens. And eventually it gets discharged out at a high or higher pressure, ultimately. Oil management is extremely critical with screws. Extremely critical. And we'll talk a lot more about that um, but in this particular case, so the suction gas is coming into the end of the motor, gets pulled into the suction end of the screw bolts, and is pushed through until it eventually exhausts out. Um, there's two ways. There's two ways that we control how much load we put on that screw. We can either use the slide valve, which is the more traditional route. Um, but yeah, it's just, it's, it's, it's how, they, I guess it all began. We, we had a slide, I'll explain that, or we could do a variable speed. So instead of having a, a slide that will move back and forth internally in the compressor, we can speed or slow down the compressor uh, to achieve the same result. We just 
you know, the slower it turns, the less it pumps, ultimately. Anyway, a slide will sit, and eh, how am I going to draw this? A slide's going to sit back, uh, it could be either end. We're going to put it, like, so the trains are up here. It's going to sit right here. Uh, and it's going to be connected. This is not at all a nice drawing, but it's going to be connected to a, a slide chamber to where the machine's going to have the ability to control it. So what this would do is it's going to move this slide, uh, whichever direction it slides it, so that it opens the housing. So in this particular example, this slide could move back uh, this way. And as it moves towards the motor, it's going to expose the screw uh, threads. And by exposing those, they're going to lose the ability to have compression. And so because it creates less compression, it can move less volume which lowers the load, but we don't change the speed. No. You're still getting, you're still getting uh, compression from the threads that aren't exposed. Yes. Yeah, so back here on the suction end of this, in, in my poor example, uh, you're still pulling refrigerant in. You're just, instead of having 100%, yes. Yeah, instead of having 100% of the bolt sealed, you're moving a slide that breaks that seal part of the way. And how these uh, screw bolts actually create seal is through the oil. So the oil in the system helps create the refrigerant seal to begin with. And it's in a very tightly machined chamber. So if you ever get a chance to pull the end off, and I have a few videos uh, out there you can see where we've actually opened these up. You can see the male and female bolt and the slide uh, internally on that compressor. Um, does this make sense? Yeah, it just seems like when you, to me it seems like if you were opening up the end of that screw, basically you would start losing all pressure Right, that picture he drew is fully loaded. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I'm saying as you pull back, you're, you're like you said, you're opening up and you're in, but if you don't have basically the enclosure closed on the end, is it going to try and pump out the top? Where is it going? So the plate gets out of the way? This, this whole housing is completely sealed from end to end. Mm -hmm. So even when the slide slides, uh, you're still sealed internally. So the refrigerant doesn't have a, a path to flow back into the suction. Right. You reduce, you reduce the actual volume moved. Yeah, it's, it's, a, it's a completely different concept, and that's why a lot of guys struggle with it. It's a totally different way of thinking about how we do compression. This, just like centrifugals and using centrifugal theory. Uh, it's, it's, just, it's a different way of how to perceive the compression process. Because you know, it's easy for us to, um, to think, you know, a recip. You know, most of us, we're gearheads. We can, we can look at a car. We understand. You take something, you push it, creates compression, it goes boom, right? Well, then you get into scrolls, and if you really think about it, you know, there's been some really good industry training on scrolls and to where we understand that a scroll, the, the chambers on the back end of it, it's, a, it's almost the exact same thing. It's the same mechanical principle of, of a reducing volume, right? So this comes in, and as it moves, this gets tighter and tighter and tighter until finally it's just this tiny little thing that shoots down. 
And so this is your suction end of it. It pulls in, and as it rotates or swivels around, it's forcing that refrigerant through in a rotary fashion until it eventually compresses it into a much smaller space and sends it out into the, into the discharge head and out it goes to the condenser coil and yada yada. Uh, in, the same, in the same way, a screw is do, using the same theory. It's just instead of having two scroll plates, it's just two th bolts. Yeah. That's the only difference. It's a supercharger. It's a supercharger. Yeah, yeah. It's a supercharger. Yeah. <laughs> you get a supercharger, you fold it off the, it's not going to work anymore. You know what I mean? Like, I don't know. It just, it boggles it's the, it's the same thing as a supercharger. Like your intake air is on the top. And say if you were to slide that intake air back a little bit, you're going to lose compression to the supercharger. You're going to lose compression. You're not going to drop it. You're going to lose it. It's volume. That's, that's reducing, mm. it's reducing the amount of volume carrying into that supercharger. <laughs> All right. These can be controlled a couple of different ways. Um, ultimately, uh, we will use either oil, the oil system, to push that slide one way or the other, uh, to load or unload it, or we may use the differentials of the uh, the discharge to pressure to suction pressure uh, to you know, force that slide one way or the other. So there's a couple of methods we can use to control that screw, but we are getting really tight on time, and I still have a lot of ground to cover. Um, another, uh, one other dramatically different design that I'll bring up. So it, whether you're working on a handbell or a train uh, with a CHNNs or the York, heck, I don't even remember the, designation for the Yorks now. But anyway, um, all of those use the same general principle. Suction in, in the inlet of the motor. The motor is usually cooled by the suction gas. That's where superheat becomes really critical. Uh, they, some, of these will, uh, some of these will use liquid injection for cooling. Uh, you can do the same thing on, on uh, scrolls as well. But if you walk up to a 06N series screw, it's a Carlisle design carrier was real big on using them. They're going to look dramatically different. So you'll have this big screw housing. You'll have a motor housing coming out. So this will be your motor. This will be part of your uh, oil with an oil filter here. And then your screws are going to be here, and your discharge is over here. Your suction on this is uh, right here. So we pull suction from the bottom of the screw up into it, and then we push that through to the discharge over here. It's the exact same principles operating everything with one minor exception. We cannot cool the motor at this point. Right. Well, and aside from the fact that they're close, it's right next to the discharge, our suction gas is over here. So every one of these I've ever worked on, you will have some kind of motor cooling circuit that will provide uh, uh, some kind of refrigerant injection, uh, usually a liquid injection style system, or they'll have an economizer, uh, and it'll use the leftover gas from the economizer to cool the motor. That just explains a lot from one of our buildings. Yes. Yeah, we, have, we've, we should have a handful of them. We did a video on one of those. It was, a, I think it was a, a carrier chiller that used a raised plate. Yes, the GX. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yep. Yeah, that's okay. Yep. So those are probably, it, those aren't the only ones. So we also have, you say the GX, you also have the G, GH or GT series that are the water-cooled version. 
basically the same overall principle. It's just water cooled instead of air cooled. Uh, it's a much smaller application. They're cute little water cooled things, honestly. Anyway, um, yes, this would be a, a Carlisle design. They're not the only ones that use this, but in in our uh, actually the train the train um, oh man RTHD series uh, that compressor I'm trying to remember it's water cooled I need to go back and look I'm trying to remember if that is suction cooled I think it is because that doesn't have a liquid injection on it so it's got a it's it's the flow goes through the compressor or through the motor of course it's going to go through the compressor but whatever Okay, any questions on screws? All right, uh, they are semi-hermetic compressors. I don't know that I've ever seen a non-semi-hermetic screw, just in case you're wondering. All right, uh, next we're going to go into the refrigeration cycles. For the sake of time, a, a scroll and recip refrigeration cycle is essentially the same as you would find on just about any regular system out there. You come out the compressors, even if you have multiple compressors, they'll come into a, a central manifold on the same circuit, you know, be however many, doesn't matter. Uh, that's going to go up, hit a condenser coil bank. Uh, hot gas goes top of the coil. Liquid comes out the bottom. From there, it's our liquid line. We may or may not have an economizer. Uh, actually, I say we may. I don't think I've seen a scroll set up with an economizer. So you, anyway, you're just going to come out. You're going to hit the metering valve into the evaporator, back to the compressor. Off we go. They're they're. Majority of the time, very, very simple machines. Even on the water-cooled side, uh, you can have water-cooled uh, scroll setups. York, I couldn't tell you the series now. I think it's the y... YD, something like that. I don't, I don't remember. Anyway, uh, they, they make a water-cooled scroll. And you would walk up to it at first, and you'd think you're going to walk up to a centrifugal until you realize there's not a big ass centrifugal on top. It's a whole bank of uh, scroll compressors in a cabinet or sitting on top of the, the condenser. So anyway, they, they do exist. Um, with that being said, let's hone more in on the screw side because I think that one probably gets people the most. A very basic setup. You're gonna have your compressor uh, that is going to come out to a set of coils. you got your condenser coils with fans. Uh, in between here is where we start to see some, some differences. You will have a oil separator. Now, there's a couple of styles of separators. They all do the same basic thing. Uh, most of your new machines... Um, most of your new machines are going to be a cylinder style. Uh, train was the one, I, I don't know that anybody, I've seen anybody else do it, but Train at one time had this big, on the RT, the, the larger tonnage RTAAs, uh, had this big U that they would use. And so the discharge would come up in Y, uh, flowing, am I drawing that right? I'm not drawing that right. Hey, damn it. No, this would be the, this would be the leaving. The, the discharge would come out and hit here, if I remember correctly. Um, <laughs> anyway, your oil port would be down here, would come out. Um, your... And this would be your oil separator. So if you're not familiar with the concept of an oil separator, 
its job is to separate oil. Shocker. <laughs> so how it does that is, you know, screws require, uh, they require the oil and a large volume of oil in order to maintain the refrigerant seal. And what that also means, uh, that oil gets carried down the refrigerant stream. Now, oil in your refrigerant stream dramatically reduces the, um, uh, the capacity if it gets into your coils because it just turns into an insulator. So as a means of, one, improving capacity, but two, guaranteeing that we keep enough oil for the compressor, um, we have a separator that just shoots the oil or the refrigerant into uh, the side and it's looking for a solid stop point to where the heavier fluids can, can fall and the lighter fluids can rise. When the heavier and lighter being uh, the oil and the lighter being the discharge gas. So at that point, your oil is going to drop down and your gas is going to rise to the top and shoot out. And we use the same basic principles with like a, um, on RTU with a, um, a trap on the gas line. And I'm blanking on the term for that too. She was, um, huh? Drip leg. That's what I'm thinking. A drip leg on a, um, on a, on a, on a gas line coming into, uh, into a furnace, for example. So any kind of moisture, any kind of contaminants, anything that's there, it's going to hit that T and your solids are going to fall and your gas can rise and it keeps things from getting into your regulator. Well, in the same exact theory, we're letting our heavy oil fall to the bottom and accumulate and our uh, superheated gases come to the top of the condenser. And if you walk up and see this big U-shaped thing, it's just trains way of being trained and just being different. Uh, most of their newer systems no longer use that. Uh, now, one thing to keep in mind, some systems do have oil cooling circuits. Uh, a lot of them don't. So, in, and we can, you have, that's one of the things we have to monitor is you don't want your oil temp to get too high. Uh, so some general parameters, usually uh, you want that oil to stay below, well, 160, I think, is some of the upper end that I've seen without just going back to the manuals. I always have to look that stuff up and I'm questioning myself. Anyway, discharge gas flowing. This is oil line coming back into the compressor. Uh, and then your de-oiled gas comes up here come out the liquid line uh, from here you're just going to come straight down you're going to hit your exv or txv whatever it be at that time and then you're going to hit your evaporator and then back over into the suction of our compressor this is a very basic circuit that any screw machine is going to have. Now, this is only the starting point. They get much more complicated than this. For example, we'll start with York. <laughs> uh, York, this kind of blends into an economizer conversation. So we'll start there. Economizers. An economizer's function is to increase economy. Go figure. So with that, one way we can accomplish that in refrigerant is by creating additional subcooling. Because the lower the subcooling you can maintain, the more pure of a, ref of a liquid refrigerant that passes through the metering device and gets to the evaporator, the more efficient you'll become. So uh, we'll wait on the carrier. York's theory on this 
They want to capture the flash gas and never allow it to make it to the evaporator. So that whatever is getting there is one, subcooled further, but two, a pure liquid. Huh? Yes, the flash tank. So from here, we would actually have a feed valve. It's just an EXV valve. It's close enough. You get it. This is going to feed into the top of what is known as the flash tank, or everybody else would call it the economizer. Um, and then in here, we're going to maintain a liquid level of refrigerant. So when we after we go through the feed valve, this is the first stage of flash. Okay, so we do that by creating a pressure differential. When we create pressure differential, the size of the pipe, if I'm not mistaken, actually ends up being about the same size. I don't think it steps up much, if at all, in pipe diameter, but we create the differential. And so this is a true two-phase part of the system. What happens in the same way that our accumulate or our oil separator works, our uh, subcooled liquid refrigerant falls, and our flashed uh, gas hangs out up top. We have a line that comes off of this, comes all the way around. Now, it doesn't actually run this far in real life, but it'll come into a economizer valve or input on the suction end of your screw housing. We just had somebody that should not be in our comment feed to show up. Am I? Uh, one second, let me, there we go. Get rid of that, whoever the heck that was. That was terrible. <laughs> Was that you? <laughs> no, anyway. Um, and then coming out of that flash tank, you will then hit what is known as the feed valve. I'm um, drain valve. Golly. Drain valve. And I spelled valve right this time. Did you get the point? You get the point. I'm not Picasso, all right? Well, and so it doesn't actually come into the suction is one of the critical keys, though. It comes, not the suction line. It comes into what is the suction inlet on the compressor. Uh, anyway. The exact same theory. This may have been 10 degrees subcooled coming into this feed valve. The liquid may leave that feed valve as much as 20 degrees of subcooling. And all of that flash gets captured and pulled back into the suction of the compressor. And then we have now a pure 20 degree subcooled liquid flowing into uh, our evaporator. Now, in reality, it's not going to, depending on how much this valve opens and how the levels work, there are sight glasses on these machines, and you might actually see a little bit of flashing sometimes. Don't freak out, that's okay. But the overall principle is this is what they're trying to achieve. You're talking about coming out of the drain valve? You'll see yes. Flashing. Yes. You might sometimes see a little bit of flashing coming out of the drain valve, depending on how much load is on it and, uh, you know, state of the refrigerant charge and several different variables. Point is, this is how the sequence is trying to function. This is their economizer. Um, and then, yeah, that just increases our overall efficiency through that evaporator. 
And so we, we just process the refrigerant a lot better. And we're shooting for just a regular, uh, usually I think these are 8 to 12 degrees of, of uh, superheat is their, is their target. So a lot of times I think we'll, we'll usually set them to, I think, a little bit lower end on 8 uh, just to try to maintain it. Yeah. Is the, uh, is the gas coming out of the flash tank? Um, I mean, I'm going to assume that it's cool, that it's cool. It's a heck of a lot cooler than coming out of the condenser, right? Does that help cool the compressor down at all? Well, what we need to cool is the motor specifically and no, because this line type taps in after the motor oh. into the actual suction of the bolts. Yeah, that's what I was confused on earlier. I was sitting there like, is that for cooling the motor? No. no. Now, carrier, yes. But we'll get into that. We'll get into that. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> uh, now, in reality, there is a economizer valve, and that is how it's referenced. It is just a uh, solenoid valve that opens once the compressor hits a certain speed. And so I think they try to get above 67%. I think, it's, I think that's right. Or somewhere in there, there's a... I'm, struggling to remember there's a set parameter that it wants to exceed that in order to open the economizer valve to start pulling this so the first little bit when it's still staging up and loading and that valve hasn't opened you're not that the economizer is not functioning or the flash tank's not pulling the flash gas off so just bear that in mind that is how it's supposed to happen don't let that freak you out uh, now, this is specifically a YCIV series. Now, we're going to take it a step further, and we're going to talk about a YVAA. Really pushing our time here. Okay, a YVAA. This goes away. And then uh, we come off of up here. We come off of um, shoot. Uh, should be the liquid. Yeah, the liquid line. And then we feed into a eductor and back into the suction. And a lot of times this, uh, I think the liquid line here will have a uh, dryer. I'm trying to remember now, I'm really struggling. If somebody online does, if I remember correctly, the YVAA, the eductor line, comes off the discharge and the liquid, and it does not pull off the evaporator. It would have to pull off the evaporator. What am I saying? Does not? No, not according to your other video. Okay. There's only three lines on it, so it pulls from your high side and drops in right after you All right. Um, Okay, so in this particular case, this also becomes a EEV or EXV. So it's, this is no longer a solenoid. So in a YVAA, this is what the new machines are. So the YCIV, so we went from YCAS was the granddaddy. Daddy became YCIV, and now the current child on the market is the YVAA. Uh, each one of those progressively got more complicated. We come out into our oil separator. They had an issue when these first came out. And if you ever work on one of these, something to be aware of. They were putting this discharge line.
for the adductor at the actual discharge of the compressor. The, one of the problems I created is that the, the joints kept breaking and leaking and it couldn't hold up to the vibration and the heat. So a revision that York come out with and any new, re, the newer revisions of the machines they produce, uh, they had, in, in the original ones, they had you move that uh, tap to the leaving side of the oil separator so that the additional heat and vibration had already been taken out of the system. And we're talking like a little, I think they're, what, a half inch line is what this runs. And you have an eductor. Now, trained centrifugals also use eductors for oil return. Uh, I'm not the best person to ask because I still am working on understanding the full concept of an eductor circuit. But from what I gather, it's a little aluminum block in this particular case, but it's, it's a device that uses um, uh, uh, two different flows. So it's using the discharge gas and the liquid line to pull, uh, to pull into this little cone assembly. And because of how it enters this assembly, it creates a... Uh, creates a siphoning effect almost that draws the oil that can get trapped elsewhere in the system and it allows that to come back into the uh, actual suction line. And these systems will have an eductor sensor between the eductor and the uh, suction that it's helping to monitor to make sure that uh, we have proper refrigerant flow. And those eductor sensors are real common to fail. They're just real bad about going out for whatever reason. Um, possibly, I'm, I'm not sure. Uh, okay, well at least somebody sounds like they know better than I do. Anyway, that's my working principle of how the adductor works is the best I can explain it. It's, it's still kind of weird tech in my brain. But, yeah. Uh, so anyway, this specific piece is for oil return. And one of the main reasons this is necessary and another major difference between the, the uh, IV series and the AA series uh, evaporator. it's a different evaporator. These, the YVAA uses a flooded barrel while the YCIV uses a DX. You do not have oil issues in the, in the same way, like oil return issues in a DX because our velocity of refrigerant flow is able to maintain pretty consistent because we're flowing inside of a controlled tube. When you start talking a flooded system, now we have this entire shell that everything kind of dumps into and then flows out the top. Really hard to get oil from down there back up there. So we put eductor circuits in so that without uh, actually just straight out pulling from the bottom of the of the um, evaporator, we are able to reclaim some of the oil that gets past the oil separator because the oil separator is not perfect. It doesn't get everything. So what does make it past the separator, uh, that eductor is able to draw out and pull back into the compressor so that it can get recaptured by the separator or have another chance at it. How do you want to look at it? It's captured before it hits the coil if it gets trapped. Yes. Yeah, and that's, just, that's and it's, it comes down to an efficiency thing, and it is you have to be very careful not to accumulate. So um, York doesn't do it, but train. Uh, on, you know, we're talking water cooled, and we'll get into this more later or next month. But you know, the the train uh, CVH series they have actually ductors coming off of the evaporator that draw that refrigerants or the oil, I'm sorry, off the bottom of the evaporator that may get to it. 
but the RTHD series, for example, doesn't have any ductor. They have a gas pump, and it's a chambered pump with solenoid valves utilizing low pressure and high pressure of the system to pull whatever oil may accumulate on the bottom of the evaporator and send it back into the condenser to then get reclaimed by the um, oil sump. So um, anyway, just some examples of other how it's used outside of just this particular way. As far as I'm aware, at least the systems we work on, uh, the YVAAs are the only things that are air-cooled that are going to have any ductor circuit that I'm aware of. I don't think the ACs have ductors. They might actually sit here thinking about it. I don't remember. I'm sure you said it, but just looking at that picture, I don't know if I missed it or what. So you have a line coming off of your discharge and your liquid coming back and bypassing your evap. Mm -hmm. The big question is, I see your little box with a line through it. Is that a metering device? Or what, how are we keeping from flooding the compressor? It's a dryer. Okay. And we're, it's, we're using the discharge gas. So to, okay. yeah, exactly. And then the combination of the two creates a siphoning okay, that yeah, draws the oil. Like, how are we keeping liquid from getting back to our compressor? But now when you say you're throwing that, dumping that hot discharge gas into that liquid, it's kind of embracing it. Sorry, I had a comment uh, saying eductors are used on YKs. I'm really freaking familiar with YK. And I'm trying to remember. I wonder if it's a specific, is it a specific series? Because I don't remember, maybe the older series having any ductor, unless I'm just really mistaken. I could be. I'm, if you couldn't tell, I'm not the world's leading expert. I just know enough about it to lead you wrong and get myself in trouble. So. <laughs> I, I, I don't. It may be, may be on the newer generations. Well, it worked on two. Huh? Yeah, right? Uh, okay, so <laughs> I will. We just had a comment come in. Uh, so the smaller YKs in the back of the oil sump between the shells. Okay. I have, to, I have to go back and look at that because, I, I, yeah, that's interesting. Um, all right. When we're talking a regular system, you know, we want to put a crankcase heater in because we want to keep the, ref the oil warm and any, uh, any refrigerant that migrates from settling into the oil. And, in, in, and we're taught traditionally that that refrigerant settles down below the oil, uh, and, and so the oil level raises up, and so the refrigerant has to flash through the oil, which creates a, uh, an oilless startup, essentially, because the refrigerant's making contact with the compressor bearings. And so when they, when, yeah, and then you'll see the side glass foams up, and they just make this horrendous growl when they start up. Now, I am not an expert on oil and refrigerant mixtures, but from a chiller's perspective and the way that the flow of the refrigerant and oil ends up working, that oil finds its way to the bottom of the shells. And so it does not end up sitting on uh, the top in the same way that you would think of a stagnant split system and how the oil migrates. So, like I said, I, I'm not an expert on this explanation, but just from practical experience, we pull oil from the bottom of our barrels. And when we have issues with, say, say oil was a significant amount of oil was to collect or migrate into our evaporator, for example we're going to take steps to remove that oil from the bottom of the evap. And one of the things I'm not sure is, you know, we use different types of oils. And, and, and one of the uh, 
I didn't think about even talking about this prior to the class. So I, I, I didn't get a chance to brush up on it, but uh, some of the oils we use, I think are probably a, a lower density than the refrigerant we're using. And so that, or lower, higher, higher density. So they would end up falling. Whereas some of like a split system, we have a lower density oil that is allowed to float to the top of the refrigerant. It may be something along those lines. I, I don't, um, I don't remember, and I, I didn't get a chance to look that up ahead of time. So, personal study topic for all of us. Uh, but that is what happens in practical application. Oil's in the bottom. We got to get it back out of the bottom. Uh, all of your eductor circuits, anything like that, you you'll find you're going to find them at the bottom of the evaporator barrels to try to pull that oil back out of there. Anyway. Um, okay, so to conclude the YVAA, we come out of the condenser, we go through an EXV, and this is our feed valve. We still have a feed valve that is controlling here, but we do not have a drain valve. So we're, not, we're no longer controlling that. And these run a pretty low superheat uh, to memory. I don't remember the, how low it actually gets, but they, they, it's, it's pretty like with a, just a few degrees, if, if memory serves me right. I, I, um, that's what I get for trying to pull everything from memory. But uh, it just all the same components will be there. It'll look very similar to a YCIV but it does function differently. And you will see things like the adductor that aren't on that older series. There'll still be a variable speed compressor. All that stuff will still be the same. Yeah, if you look at your evaporator, see the still where your pipes are coming in. Yeah. Yeah, that's usually the first thing I look for. Is I've, if I walk up to one of these Yorks, I'm not sure which is which. One, the color is different. So you can tell by looking at the color that the newer ones are a darker um, they, they went with a darker color palette. I don't know, but, um, then the evaporator, you, I mean, like I said earlier, how you tell the difference between flooded or, or DX, just look at that. If it's a, if, 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 if it's a DX, you know, it's an older YCIV series. If it's a flooded, you know, you're dealing with a YVAA and it's just higher efficiency. Bitzer. That was the other brand I was trying to think of earlier was a Bitzer. Uh, those are, if I'm not mistaken, those are pretty similar to a handbell and they're just basic design and how they function. All right. Um, what's our time? We've been talking about oil management kind of as we go. We've been talking about economizers. Uh, we don't see very many of the carriers like we used to. We'll talk about it real quick though. Okay. Any questions up to this point? All right. Okay. So your carrier systems, um, the separators, oil separators, instead of being a, a vertical cylinder, they'll actually end up being a, uh, uh, they'll end up being a horizontal uh, cylinder. Uh, that the discharge comes into on one side, flows through a series of chambers in here, out, and your uh, purified refrigerant comes out. And then we have off the bottom our oil, which then goes into a oil pump. Uh, and then out that oil pump back into the compressor. Uh, and I'm trying to think, actually, the, the older series will have an oil pump. The new X series, I think, are just positive displacement. 
those do not have a pump. So depending on what series you're working on, pump may or may not be there. Anyway, the separator will essentially be the same basic design. We're coming out. Now, one of the worst things Carrier has ever done, and to this day, I, I just, I struggle under, because they still do it. They still do it. They put a ball valve on the discharge of the system with an actuator that does not seal and it becomes this horrendous leak point every freaking time. Now it comes down to, the, they do that for migration, oil control, and um, uh, I don't think it has anything to do with startup. But anyway, uh, I really wish Carrier would stop doing that. So York puts ball valves on their discharges as well, but they actually have a cap that you can put on there and seal it. So even when the stem does begin to leak, it's got the ability that you, you can stop the leak. Those carriers, you cannot. Just, anyway, ball valve will be uh, right here. Leaving the, uh, or the actuator valve will be, be there. Anyway, coming out, we come out of the condenser. And then we go into a little brace plate and each circuit will have its own brace plate uh, heat exchanger. Now, uh, this technically should be the other way. Either way, you'll get the, you'll get the concept. Uh, liquid line coming in will go through a EEV and then we'll come out. Uh, actually, dang it, drew that wrong. Your liquid line EEV will be down here on the leaving side of that economizer, but there will be a separate circuit coming off with a, um, I know the older ones used a solenoid valve. I don't remember if the newer ones do. I know they have EEVs on it. The older ones were TXV. Either way, you'll have a, metering valve coming off the liquid and tapping in uh, should be on the bottom. Just you get the concept here. So we've got two different circuits. We have one that just straight liquid line runs through, comes back out liquid. You have another circuit where it branches off the liquid line, goes into the brace plate through a metering valve and then the leaving side on the top end of that braze plate will come back over to the uh, motor cooling of the compressor. This is Carrier's economizer. What they're doing, the liquid line is able to flow through as normal, but the when the economizer circuit is activated or the motor cooling circuit is activated, we are subcooling this refrigerant down further. So again, I'll use the example. It's going in, say, 10 degrees or 3 degrees subcooled, coming out 20. All right? Now, we are not, we still have the flash gas. That is still happening and in getting into the evaporator. We're not doing anything to capture that. Uh, the same way that the York is. But the for the cooling circuit that's creating the subcooling, that flash gas gets sent directly back into the motor, and a lot of the times it will have, uh, it won't fully flash it. It will still have a little bit of uh, liquid coming through there so that it has enough capacity to finish cooling that motor down. And so it, it's, it's a motor cooling circuit that also functions as a economizer. Actually, I need to modify that statement a little bit. Jeez, it's been a minute since I've worked on one of these. We don't have that many. There will be a bypass line that is on a solenoid. 
So when the machine turns on, the economizer circuit is always flowing. So it's always cooling and getting pulled back into the suction of the motor. Then there is a motor cooling valve that is energized and bypasses that economizer braze plate to then send straight liquid on purpose straight to the motor to lower motor temperatures. And it's just liquid injection is all it really is. Sorry, how I said that the second time is the full definition. Almost forgot that the first time. Huh? <laughs> yeah, well, and that's the thing. So I am not by any means going into any kind of advanced theory here. All of this is 101 air-cooled principles. I've mentioned a couple of advanced-ish things, the adductor, for example. But for the most part, this is, this is just air-cooled chillers. Um, and that's my goal, is to introduce you to the information and to give you a baseline to go from. And like I said, tomorrow night we're going to go into more of the controls and how we stage and why we stage and how the machine reacts to different situations. So that'll be tomorrow. Uh, you're not going to walk out of this ready to go work on an air-cooled but if you picked up a manual and started reading it, it would make a whole lot more sense to you is my goal. That's what I'm trying to accomplish here. Huh? I just want to be able to be here tomorrow. Okay, we have audio back now. Sorry, my little uh, mic receiver for my mic died on me. Can y'all y'all singing? Yep, all right, we got audio back. Probably a lot lesser quality, but anyway. Uh, <clears throat> so happens when you live. So you can have too much flow on a system. When you start to deal with uh, high water flow, you can actually start running into high approach values or uh, high, no, low superheats. So you can get low superheats, high approaches. Uh, you can start tripping low pressures, high pressures. A lot of really weird symptoms can come from high, too much flow, too many GPM, just the same as too little. They look very similar. They don't look the same. Yeah, pretty close they don't look the same, but they look similar. So, in short, you know, low flow is, is pretty straightforward. You just don't have enough flow to carry the BTU capacity you need. So, if you don't have it, you don't have the heat transfer, the same things that happens when we have low airflow, it's just not there, right? Now, say this is our water tube 
and the refrigerants on the outside, water is inside. So we have a flooded system. As we're flowing, if we have too much GPM and there is an excessive amount of force being applied behind that water to where it's, it's, it cannot properly uh, maintain flow, what ends up happening is we create a slight turbulence right here where the water meets the edge of the pipe. And this little bit of turbulence creates this little uh, cycling effect in the water. And so what ends up happening is all of this water here in the middle flows right past it. And this turbulence turns into an insulator and it does not allow heat transfer. And that in the simplest possible way I could say it is laminar flow. And to fix this, we need to we need to remove that uh, we need to re remove that turbulence, which is created by the excessive flow. So if we slow the water down, that's moving through the barrel, which you always slow it down on the leaving side. So if you slow that water down, that turbulence will stop, and you will start to see your uh, readings dramatically improve. Uh, an example of this was we had a air-cooled system that was struggling with uh, uh, low superheat. It was having really low superheat, and one, eat this, the compressor was having a hard time. One, one circuit was down, one was running. Very small building. This was designed to just need one compressor at a time but it couldn't maintain it with just one compressor. And again, low superheat. Uh, but our saturation was actually elevated and we had a really high approach value. So when I say saturation was elevated, we were leaving 50 degrees with a 40 degree saturation. Pushing, you know, tipping into the 30s at times. And that compressor was full open, screwed much as it could push. Uh, that And that's that's what it came down to. I got to looking at it and I, at the time, so this particular system didn't have pressure for it, so I couldn't take a legitimate drop across it. So all I could do was base it off of my approach and saturation, the, the refrigerant readings. That's all I had to go off of to try to find a balance that the system could function in. So I went over to the to the leaving side and began to pinch that valve down and eventually found a happy spot to where not only could we make a uh, set point, we were dramatically unloading and our superheat came up. We were uh, we had a, a set point on this one of four degrees for superheat. And we went from doing like two degrees to maintaining our four to five degrees of superheat. And then our approach went from uh, 10 to 12 was where it was fluctuating down to five degrees of, of approach on the evaporator. And the whole system just stabilized. The compressor was able to back off and everything just whoop, found its groove and just, and just stabilized. It was beautiful. And that was the problem. We had too much flow because it's very common. People walk up to a chiller and they think all valves need to be wide open. If I'm having some kind of issue with it, why the hell is that valve partly closed over there? I need to go. That's, that's not right. Well, actually, no, that's wrong. It, it's, the system has a balancing on it. So you can't just play with valves like that. And that's what it was happening. We were creating a laminar flow effect inside of the evaporator. When I slowed the water down, the turbulence stops, heat exchange happened, everything stabilized. And we no longer had to run that compressor wide open for no reason. Laminar flow. I would highly suggest doing some separate research and just kind of trying to get a deeper understanding on what that looks like. 
<laughs> you learned the hard way, didn't you? I did. And <laughs> it looks really cool when you actually see it. See what? It looks like the plan or flow. It looks like the water's not moving. Yeah, it's if you're in actually, water, it's Oh, yeah, if you're in seeing like a clear tune. Yeah, yeah, it, yeah. Does, it yeah. looks like the water doesn't even move. It's, it's pretty cool, actually. Yep. Any final questions? Okay. Well, Y'all have a good evening. Appreciate everybody. I'm taking my chair back. <laughs>